So I was going to transition us to your ocean heat content. Oh, did you slog your way through that? <laughs> I did. You did a good job, Jim. I mean, the presentation, <laughs> you spoke well. It was engaging. I definitely like the graphics. A lot going on, a lot to talk about. So I'll link it. I'll link when I do these edits, I'll, uh, I'll link it because I thought, you know, it's another important one. <laughs> you know, the ocean is basically like changing significantly and just how we could talk about the graphs. I mean, they were awesome. Just showing well, the difference. It's like everything else. I wanted to set up things as opposed to here's some crazy graphics and, and, what, and people are going to go, what's he talking about? So that's why I thought it was important to talk about the difference between sensible and latent heat. But also kind of like, here are all your metric prefixes. Well, it shows you like it's astronomical. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you say a zeta joules and zeta, and people, what the hell is a zeta? 10 to the 21. That's one followed by 21 zeros. That's a big number. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And just how much energy like the oceans have absorbed. You're like the numbers yeah. you gave were crazy. Like 93% it's absorbed the greenhouse gases energy. And you're like, oh shit, well that's coming out. <laughs> it's and the thing is, okay, it's absorbed 93%. So the 7% that hasn't been absorbed, look at what that 7% has done to the, to above the ocean to the ice, to the atmosphere, what the atmosphere is doing to the permafrost. Just think of that 7%. And what I was trying to drive home was, you know, with, when you had the thermal hailing flows, that sequesters heat and carbon. Well, as I, sh as I tried to show, and I think I made a strong case for it, we're seeing the stratification in the upper layers and we're seeing what I think is evidence of the thermal hailing flow slowing down. So that means the heat and the CO2 is gonna stay concentrated in the upper layers right well we can't we we already know we've warmed up the uh, the ocean surface so much so much that's why you're getting the more powerful hurricanes and stuff like that we also know that as water temperatures increase gas solubility decreases so you got a kind of a two-fold thing going on here you have the carbon is staying in the upper layers it's not being brought to depth so it's not being sequestered and we're warming up the the, those layers there, so the carbon will no longer be able to be absorbed from the ox from the atmosphere to be dissolved in the ocean, because you're gonna then soon you're gonna reach gas solubility saturation, where it can't absorb more gases because it's gotten so much warmer, and then you're gonna get you're gonna warm past that saturation point where the gas that's in solution is gonna come out of solution and go back into the atmosphere in addition to what we continue to, to pump. Oh this is God. why I say that when people you know, think that, oh, the atmosphere is the driver of climate, no. Yes, it has a role. The driver of climate is the ocean. And so when I hear Michael Mann, okay, he's an atmospheric scientist, might want to bone up on his oceanography a little bit. But uh, when he says, oh, we kept it under 2C, everything's fine, we can do that. No, Michael, you're going to have all this heat, this two times 10 to the 23 mm. joules of energy in the ocean, that's going to do what? It's going to diffuse back into the atmosphere. Nightmare stuff. But yeah, keep it's, going. I mean. This is why I'm starting to see that the predictions of seven to nine or even 11 C by 2100 is probably realistic. Okay, there's a potential for 11 C because yeah. of the tipping points and like all the uh, stuff that's not being accounted for, like just what's going on. And like, it's so the acceleration. Um, it's, wow. And as I just, I just posted, this is why I was a little delayed. I was posting my latest video about plants and plants are now respiring. They're not photosynthesizing because it's gotten so much warmer that they're stressed out. So they're respiring. So they are not drawing down the CO2 they're drawing down oxygen and they're putting CO2 back into the atmosphere. But plants do that. No, I mean, plants during yeah. the day, in normal situations, during the day, they draw down CO2, suck up water from the ground, they make the glucose and they put out oxygen. Comes nighttime, no sun energy, they respire. They now take in oxygen and put CO2 back out. But when you look at the budget of the carbon, when you look at the net, well, the net is that they 
CO2 came out of the, the more of it came out of the atmosphere, more oxygen went into the atmosphere. So the net was a reduction of CO2. Well, now we're seeing evidence that that is reversing, that they're going to be putting more CO2 into the atmosphere than they draw down. They're going to be taking out more oxygen from the atmosphere than they put out into the atmosphere. So that is further adding to the CO2 levels. And when you look at the fact that we're seeing a decrease in ocean productivity and phytoplankton provide 55 to 80% of atmospheric oxygen, so their productivity is decreasing. If you got the situation with plants, with terrestrial plants, is it any small wonder that atmospheric scientists have been measuring a decrease in oxygen levels? That They're is measuring so alarming. It. It's happening. That is alarming. Like any horror movie next to, oh yeah, by the way, the oxygen levels are going. Like that's crazy. It's so alarming. Like as a species, like instinct. That's what we need to survive. I don't know, like, you know, what we think is going to happen if we keep continuing, which we will. And like you said, the tipping points are out of control and then they'll keep amplifying. But what yeah. will happen is the hydrothermal vents will be where life is on the planet. Yeah, the bottom of the oceans. <laughs> because they don't need oxygen. They just use uh, methane and sulfur and sulfides and it's yeah. chemotrophs down there. They don't have to photosynthesize. It's like we're reversing back to like the beginning of life, <laughs> but like that's all that's left. At first, uh, oxygen was a poison. That is so, so the bizarre. one reason why it built up so readily and rapidly into the atmosphere was it was a poison and all the organisms could use it. So it built up and then some organisms evolved and say, oh, oh, we've got the resource here we can tap into. <laughs> yeah, it's so interesting and just, like you said, they evolve to this certain environment. And when the environment changes, you either die off or somehow evolve with it, you know? Exactly, exactly. It's so interesting. I love that stuff. <laughs> anyway. I mean, when you, when you look at like the Jurassic, when we had the really the big sauropod dinosaurs stomping around and stuff like that. And even if you go back <laughs> further to like the uh, Permian and, and that kind of stuff, Silurian maybe, you know, we had the, you know, the dragonflies with the, you know, the 16 inch wingspans kind of buzzing around, you know. <laughs> I know. The reason why you had those big organisms was because the oxygen level was close to, it was like 28%. And that doesn't even seem to be that much, but that is a lot, I guess. But it, it's now under 20%. You know, when you look at the high school books and stuff like that, oh, oh oxygen level is 21%, nitrogen is 78%, and the other 1% is all these other gases, blah, blah, blah. Well, 28 to 21 to under 20, oxygen is decreasing. It's been decreasing very slowly, you know, over 100 million years or so. But in the last, guess what, since Industrial Revolution times, it's... Decrease the, the rate of decreases is picking up. 